Blake, what's going on, man? We're it's back. been a while since we've yeah talked. missed you the past couple episodes. It's I nice know. to be back and I saw you uh, put out some other episodes with um, who was the last guest that you talked to? It was a really interesting conversation. Um, Bo, yeah, the okay. owner of Arc. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. I didn't even catch that. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, he's I've known him for a long time, and it's, it's an awesome guy. Been cool to see his growth and and being able to kind of ride along on those coattails with the art company and sure. Um, yeah, just a good friend. Well, that's awesome. Well, it's always good to catch up and kind mm-hmm. of see how the state of things are in, yeah. in the financial world, the real estate world. Um, you had sent me some uh, documentation right before mm-hmm. we started this recording, so I'm curious, what, what is that about and, and yeah. what's going on in the world right now? Matt, just kind of, it's interesting because no one's got a crystal ball. No one knows what direction we're going, but just looking at where the real estate market is today and then where is, where is it headed is, you know, the, the multi-million dollar question. Everything is, or I don't want to say everything, but a lot of things is being uh, driven by where rates are and where we think rates are going to go. And as we've alluded to a couple of times when we had Travis on, you know, the Fed raising and lowering rates and changing or, or not raising um, does indirectly affect those mortgage rates. Um, but where, and, and right now we're in a spot where they may have one more raise by the end of the year, they're alluding to they might. And so people that don't have to buy are saying, well, you know, maybe I need to wait to see if they actually do it or not, um, or rates are still 7%. So people who maybe were waiting to buy that, you know, what's going to happen on the Fed side, how's that going to affect mortgage rates? You know, they're saying rates are still 7% now. Are they going to go up more if the Fed bumps out a little bit more? Are they going to come back down? Um, so a little bit of uncertainty, uh, but overall, we still just don't have inventory. Um, and so... I think we still have kind of the same problem where we we have a lack of inventory and we still have still a seller's market. Um, and we'll we'll throw this little sheet up I sent you to kind of talk through what that looks like. But um, we're in a unique spot. Yeah. Uh, still a lot of activity, a lot of stuff going on, but a unique spot where it's like almost like a hurry up and wait for those who don't have to buy right now. Yeah, I was curious. Just um, yeah. it looks like uh, you know looking at that sheet that you sent me. Um, Americans sitting on a tremendous equity. So, dude, this is like the biggest talking point of are we going to go into a recession and how does that affect housing? Are we going to see foreclosures? And I think this chart right here shows there gives you the answer of of no, we're not going to see a lot of foreclosures because of how much equity homeowners have. And so, just kind of looking at that top one and that that lighter green bubble, but mortgage homes with more than 50% equity, meaning they owe less than half of what the value of the house is. And that's 30%. So a third of homes in America are have less than, or more than 50% equity, which is huge. So like we have a recession, housing prices drop even 20%, which is massive. There's still 30%, a third of the homes in America are still not underwater, mm-hmm. which I think speaks volumes to, and, and the that was not the case. I don't have the numbers, but for 07, 08, when everything, that was not the case then. There was not that much equity as there is today. Um, kind of following that down, 30 to 50% of equity, you've got uh, 21%, right? So it's still, you know, fifth of the market there. Um, and then zero to 10% is just like 2% of the market, right? But mortgage homes with negative equity is 0.12%. So people who are under- already underwater on the yeah, mortgage. Okay. Is, is 0.1 percent of the market. So very low, very, 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 very low. Yeah, yeah. very low. That's awesome. um, which why would it be? The market's only increased for the past really 12 years, right? So yeah. um, that number is, is to be expected. But um, this is another one of the biggest ones: is zero mortgage, own it free and clear. It's 39 percent. 39 percent of Americans own their yeah. house outright. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And so, it's, wow. so when you think of that, like one is a realer, but also are you one of, of them? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. No, because debt's so cheap, right? And right. so, and we'll we can come back to that because yeah. I think that's an interesting talking point. But thinking of it as an investor as well, you go out and say, well, you know, I want to buy your house, and you own it free and clear. I could go borrow money at as an investor, eight maybe nine percent. Or what if we could work out like a seller financing, and I give you five percent? It's mm-hmm. a win for me. If you don't need the cash to do, you know, move wherever you're going, then maybe that's a steady steady stream of income at 5% for you. So 
uh, I think it's an avenue that investors can take advantage of as well, knowing that there's so much equity out there. And you can do that with the you know 30 to 50 percent or 50 percent plus um, of equity stakes that people have. You, you can do a hey, I'll give you you know the the bank's going to cover 50 percent of this purchase, but would you hold back the other 50 percent as a seller financing? Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting piece to say like wow, over half. I mean you got. 39% that is owned free and clear, and then another 30% that is owned with more than 50% of equity. So you've got 60% of the market. Am I doing that math right? 70% yeah, of the 70%, market. 70% yeah. of the market is has the ability to sell or finance. I mean, I guess okay. all of them do, but like practically. Um, but but to bring it home back to, um, yeah. you know, everybody likes to stoke fears of recession yeah. and stuff. <laughs> You don't see a housing crisis looming, kind of like the one we had, you know, X number of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of people were underwater on the mortgage. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think we'll see that just because there's so much equity in the market now. A little bit of good news. So that's, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, great yeah. news. Yeah. It's great. Um, it's interesting to see all the projections <laughs> from people way smarter than me, from the National Association of Realtors and the the mortgage groups from a national level and economists saying, hey, we're, we're going to see, and it's guaranteed as much as they can guarantee anything in the future, we're going to see rates come down. When, you know, that's the big question, but by the end of the year, they expect it to, to come down a little bit from seven to maybe six, six and a half. By the end of next year, 2024, they're talking about four and a half to five, which is huge. And think about what that's going to do, supply and demand, right? Demand's going to spike back up because the people that are waiting on the sidelines of saying, hey, I want to, I don't want to, I don't have to move, so I'm going to wait till rates come down. When they do come down, What's it going to happen to demand? It's going to skyrocket. Supply is just going to get compressed even more, and it's still compressed from 12 years ago. And so it's still going to be a seller's market, even mm -hmm. though rates get better. Yeah, and yeah. prices will just go right back. Go up. right back up. Yeah, which wow. will um, really affect this even more. It's going to be more equity, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next you know six to 12 months uh, from that market cycle. So. Uh, another really cool metric that I thought was, was super interesting, and I'm using this a lot with my sellers right now, kind of setting expectations. So active homes, um, so homes for sale, Jefferson and Shelby County, which is pretty much like the greater Birmingham area. Um, and what I like to look at is average days on market. So things that are currently on market, not sold yet today, of all of those homes, which there are um, 2,846 homes listed, on average, they've been on market 49 days. 49 days. Right. Okay. And think about a year and a half, two years ago, things were selling day one, weekend. Just sure, immediately. yeah. Seven days, 11 days. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so looking back and saying, all right, today, if I go back and say how many sold homes this year, we've got 11,489. So, you know, 11,000 11, 11, homes have sold this year. The average days on market for those homes up to this point 24. Hmm. So what that tells me is things are sitting on the market longer, right? Things that are currently on the market have been there an average of 49 days. Things that were listed earlier this year sold in an average of 24 days. Now, is that to be expected just with the, with the seasons and being summertime and stuff like that? Um, yes and no. I think coming into the fall, you know, things historically do slow down. They haven't in the past three years just because it's been crazy. Sure. Um, but I think rates have, have shown their face in the sense of slowing people down uh, on the buy side. Okay. And so market absorption, which is a, a metric we use just to say how much inventory versus demand, supply and demand there is. Um, no, no, I lost it. Uh, so it's 2.9 months of inventory, right? So um, in app, like kind of a break even between seller market and buyer market is about six months of inventory. Right, so we're about half that at three months of inventory. Okay. And that's, that's slowed up a little bit. It, it was compressed even more, closer to like one month of inventory for the past two years. And so we're still in a very strong seller's market. Anything less than six months is a strong seller's market. Oh, okay, yeah. I was like wondering what the grand scheme of like, if you go all over the country, what is considered um, a normal amount of time for a home to sit on the market mm -hmm. averaged over the, you know, I know every part of the country is different, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like what yeah, the, uh, six, well, so right now I don't have anything the, less the than six thing. months <laughs> is, well, yeah, less than six months is considered that a seller's like market. an incredibly long time. I know, yeah. right? Cause we've been exposed to, if it doesn't sell week one, it'll what, be what's sold by next weekend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is. So, but so looking at this and saying, all right, well in Jefferson County, it's, 
you know, 49 days, you know, it's almost two months here, which is a little bit higher than, you know, just your averages. I go to a seller. So I, I've got a couple of listings now. One of mine in Avondale, that flip is still just sitting there. I was curious. Yeah. Yeah. That was still on the market. And it's, I got to remind myself as I've got to remind my sellers, we're not in the market where things sell immediately anymore. Right. And, and here's the data to back it up. It's not just Blake's opinion and his very tiny exposure to the market and the you know, few sales we do a year. It's here's the data for both counties that are, that are big in Birmingham. Um, and so just realizing, and, and when we go to a listing appointment, we say, look, here's the data. We're going to price it right. We're going to make sure it's in a good condition. Uh, we're in a good area. We need to prepare that it's going to take two months to sell. And that's just kind of the new normal we're in. Setting those expectations yeah. so you don't have clients that are like, my realtor sucks, yeah. what's going on? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's cool that you're able to back that up because, you yeah. know, I'm sure there are a lot of realtors out there that maybe just don't take the time to dig up that information and maybe just yeah. kind of say, well, you know, it's just the way it is. It's taken a while. Know, yeah, and it's, what? you know, I always want to have um, something to go back on, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like they're calling me saying, hey, I'm, I'm frustrated, like what's going on? And, and instead of just not having the data, like, well, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And they're like, well, you're not doing open houses or we didn't take out a newspaper article or, you know, yeah. it's like, no, this, this is, <laughs> this is where we're at. Right. Which I've done before, before I, you know, <laughs> like very early in my career, um, because the seller asked me, like I literally yeah. paid, I don't know how much it was for a newspaper <laughs> article. Um, so, but now knowing and having this data and using it as a tool to just set those expectations and, and kind of on the buyer side, you know, that flips a little bit to where we're still in a seller's market per um, market absorption, but buyers have leverage now. Mm. And once rates come down, prices go back up, all the buyers enter the market again, it's going to be like a year or two ago when buyers had zero leverage. You had to make offers, no inspection, you know, take away your financing contingency and just have a lot more risk as a buyer. Where Right now, you've got some leverage. And so... So I guess you kind of have to weigh the, you know, maybe a higher rate, but more leverage versus a, you know, try to strike gold and get a lower rate. But, you know, you have to kind of my experience was, hey, we bought when rates were great, Mm -hmm. but it was a challenge, um, you know, being able to get a home. A lot of competition, a lot of people trying to buy homes. Yeah, I think uh, we only put in offers on two homes, but one of the first ones we did, uh, somebody else swooped in and took it. Yeah. Nothing worse, you know, yeah. but it we're worked not, out. Yeah, scale. we're not seeing that as much. Um, we're seeing it some. Uh, we yeah. I listed one last weekend that we had two offers, and it was, you know, highest and best by Sunday. So we're still seeing that mm-hmm. uh, a little bit, but not, you know, we had I had three listings go live last week, only, only one that happened on. Okay. And I think we're priced correctly. I think we're, we're doing all the right things, but it's just, hey, instead of all three happening, it was just one doing that. Uh, so, so take home point, if you're looking to buy a home, it may be better to move on that now versus mm-hmm. maybe three months from now or yeah, six months. So from now. overall, I think my opinion is yes on that, but okay. not just to give a realer answer to say by now. Yeah, um, it comes down to what your goals are, but just kind of think yes. through. You can't refinance the purchase price in the future of the house. Mm-hmm. Like once you buy it, you're you're locked in. Yeah, you can refinance the rate. So if rates come down next year to four and a half then you can always refinance and capture a lower rate. But you can't a year from now say, oh, if prices drop 20 grand, let me just kind of just knock that 20 grand off my mortgage. Like you're stuck with it, yeah. right? But today you can negotiate that purchase price yeah. where arguably maybe or a year ago you couldn't, maybe a year from now you can't just depending on where the market goes. And so don't, I've said this for the past couple of weeks, but don't buy just to buy. But if you're going to buy in the next six months, 12 months anyways, this could be a great time to do it because you can get in and, and maybe get, you know, cash from the seller to go towards your closing costs. You can keep more cash in your pocket or, you know, if, if cash isn't a big deal for you, but having, you know, a lower monthly payment is mm-hmm. then, you know, negotiating that purchase price where, yeah, you may lock in at a 7% rate, but they're not going to be at seven forever. Yeah. Right. And just like my investing piece, don't buy with it not working financially today, but hoping that it does with lower rates later. Like that's a bad financial sure. decision. But if you can make it work today comfortably and it fits your budget, then it's just a bonus when they do come down later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, going back to the data, uh, we, we kind of had an interesting point versus um, 
you said a lot of people own 50% of their home uh, or all, you know, the yeah. number, I forget the number that you said, but most people yeah, or a large portion own their home outright. Should that be a goal for most people? Just, I got to get my house paid off yeah. and just be, just own it free and clear. That's a great question, man. I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like you're probably, you're a very financially literate person. Obviously, we have this podcast. I feel like if you wanted to, you could have your home paid off, but you... Mm-hmm. I think that's more of a decision not to do it, and I'm mm-hmm. curious as to why that is. Yeah, I don't think there's a black and white answer. Maybe not. Right, and there, I never give you a straight answer, right? Yeah, but, well, that's that's good yeah. because, you know, I, yeah, like earlier, but, should you buy now or not? Yeah. So I think it depends on your goal. So should you pay your house off if you have the ability to, or should it be your number one goal to pay it off before you attack anything else or invest? Um, and the answer for me is no. Okay. Um, I've got, I think we've got like a three, three and a half percent interest rate on my home. That's really cheap money for me. So if I go out, if I spent, you know, I, I forget what we owe in our house, but if I took a chunk of cash to pay that off, or if I just funneled it all, you know, all my pat or extra income towards paying that off, then I don't have that extra income or chunks of cash to go invest. And basically it's what, what I'm saying when I do that, and this is how it works in my head, is I don't think I can take this money and go get better than a 3.5% return on it, which for me is completely false. Like I can go and get 20, 30, 40% return on any investment that I make, Mm -hmm. uh, or that's the goal. And so if I can either, you know, pay on my house at 3.5% rate and use this money to go generate way more than that, then why would I pay it off? Why would you? Yeah. Um, Now, there's some risk in that, right? Because I owe you know, if everything just crashes and burns and I lose everything and I still owe, you know, $1,200, yeah. whatever my monthly payment is on my house, then, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck paying that note. Um, for me, and again, I'm a little more, I'm, I'm more comfortable with risk than probably a lot of people. I know I can go, I think my, my mortgage payment, it's so, it's low. It's like 1300 bucks a month. Yeah. I know if I lose everything, I can go swing a hammer or work at Starbucks and make 1300 bucks. And pay your mortgage. Right. Yeah. Like, so, so it's, for me, it's kind of a no brainer. Like I can hustle and I can, I can make that happen. Yeah. And so if, and that's how I kind of look at everything. What's worst case scenario mm-hmm. and can I still make it work? Um, now I've got one of my best friends is, um, he's a financial advisor and, and he agrees with the principles, but for his family and just the comfort and they don't want the risk, they just say, look, we're going to feel more comfortable as a family paying our house off and just having no debt on it. Once we do that, now we'll take our passive income and go and invest in real estate. He, he mm-hmm. does a lot of other investing, but into real estate. And so, and that's his comfort level. And so that's the right answer for him. Right. So it's just, um, I think it's case by case and what your goals yeah, are. Yeah, that's interesting because a lot of people I think would agree with you. Uh, at least that's what I've seen as far as like the little, it's crazy the ads and stuff I get yeah. now after doing this. <laughs> Talking too much um, real estate. But the little, little TikTok you know, snippets and stuff. And, yeah. and a lot of people I would say would say, Hey, take this money that you're going to use to pay your house off and do this with it, do that with it. It's way better to invest with that yeah. money versus just the comfort of knowing that you own your home. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is cool to hear somebody else who's also financially literate, I would imagine, mm-hmm. um, saying, no, I'm, I want to have my house completely paid off. I think a lot of people would, I know I would feel great knowing that yeah. my house is paid for. And, uh, one of my coworkers, he made that a goal. And, uh, yeah. Uh, he has some other issues going on, but he knows at the end of the day that he's going to have his house no matter what because it's paid yeah. off, other than like property taxes and right. stuff. So uh, pretty cool, pretty interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So, Blake, uh, if you had the money to pay your house off right now, which I imagine you might somewhere, would you do it? No. It's not a smart decision. It's a bad financial decision because I can take that money, go invest it, and make arguably 10x what the interest rate on my house is. So I think that's a bad idea. So you would not like the comfort of knowing that you own your home outright? No. <laughs> you seem to be, you've said it yourself, you're a little more comfortable with risk than yeah. most people. I'll take a little more risk, and I know I can hustle and make that mortgage payment. If everything else falls apart and I lose everything, I can go hustle and make that mortgage payment, and I'm comfortable with the risk associated with keeping that payment. Okay. Interesting. Interesting take on that. Well, moving on, man. What's going on uh, in the rest of your world with ARC and everything? Yeah, uh, yeah, man. Arc, ARC's growing like crazy. We had a couple agencies, kind of some bigger global, I guess global names locally in this market close shop. Um, and I think that is a derivative of the market slowing down to where you've got kind of those quote-unquote part-time agents just um, – not really producing, and, and those those offices. I, I don't know the true answer of why they close. This is kind of my opinion of um, 
th those closing down, and so ARC has absorbed a lot of those agents and, and a lot of big time agents. I really? Some, yeah. And so uh, it's growing like crazy. We just opened an office. We talked about this on the podcast with Bo, um, but just opened an office down 280. Um, we've bought out a place in Huntsville. We've got a place in Orange Beach. Montgomery's growing. Um, and so, hey, the beach market. That'd be yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. So I think Bo said, I forget, 14 or 15 offices in the in the state right now, um, and the largest independent brokerage in in the state. So, so I guess there's still a lot going on, even though there's not a lot of inventory. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot for agents to be doing, I guess. And maybe this is a dumb question, but you know, if a lot of people are are not really interested in selling at this time right now, um, and the inventory is low. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Playing golf. We're going to lunch. <laughs> that's what, that's what real estate agents do, right? That's, <laughs> that's the lifestyle. We do that's what everybody wants. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you got to think about it. So, I mean, just looking at this stat through the end of August, there were 11,000, over 11,000 homes sold. I mean, to be in the top, this, this, is, this is actually, be in the top 1% of agents in Birmingham, you need to sell 40 homes a year, mm. right? So think about that. I mean, 40, like, what's 11,000 divided by 40? I don't know that math real quick, but that's a lot of that's different lot. realtors. That's still a lot, yeah. Right? And so, and <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know how many were sold in 08 or 09, but it was in the thousands. And so to be successful and be, it, you don't have to have a surplus of inventory and work. You just, you just have to be great at what you do and what you focus on, and you can still succeed in any yeah. market, right? And so I think it's important for an agent to carve out what their market is, be the expert in it. And like for me, you know, it's Bluff Park and Hoover. Like that's my market. R regardless of where the market goes cycle wise, I still want to be number one in that market. So somebody's selling, someone's getting relocated, someone always. inherits a house. There's always houses selling in any market because it has to happen. I want them to think of me. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm affected. Yeah. On the the top end of like actually how much business I do, but from a security standpoint, I want to try to build a brand and build a business that, you know, it's worst case is not falling apart and yeah. it's not costing me, you know, I'm, I'm not losing money. So uh, just out of my own curiosity, how, how many homes, I know you have a team mm -hmm. under you, uh, what's your average and what does this year look like for you? Yeah, this year's a little lower, so we'll probably do around 50 this year. Okay. Um, past two years we did maybe 50 to 60. We, we past two years, we did like 65 to 80, somewhere in that range. Closings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so, awesome. um, so a great number, right? Yeah. Uh, awesome number. I'm super thankful and grateful for all my people, but I have seen that, you know, as this data has shown, and like I said, that top end, like that extra 20 sales, like I've, I've seen that kind of drop off a little bit. Mm. Um, and again, I, I like the extreme ownership model. So, um, how can I succeed and keep that or even growth? How can I continue to sell more regardless of market conditions? And what is that in my business that I can execute in to make sure that that happens? Yeah. Um, that's a million dollar question, right? We're still, we're, we're working that out every day, trying to, trying to get bigger and better. Well, you mentioned extreme ownership. I always like to close out each episode or at least one episode and kind of see you reading anything interesting lately. Yeah. Um, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. It's okay. a, a great book just about, um, little chunks like how do you eat an elephant right one bite at a time just and and stat and habit stacking so if um <clears throat> what's a good this example? is not a real estate book this is just more no of no like just a, like general really life business yeah. um but it's uh it's got a lot of different principles on how to create habits or get rid of bad habits mm. and so like it you know smoking is a great example of like okay i want to quit smoking um so what are you doing to be able to quit smoking it's hard to be a runner and a smoker so maybe you pick up running, yeah. right? Or it, it's hard to quit smoking when everyone in your life smokes, right? Sure. So maybe you should shift on who you're hanging. So it just talks about, like, what are the little things you can do to uh, change your habits? Change your and, habits. And make them for the better. So but I guess it kind of falls in line with, like, goal setting and stuff, but more like just setting up yourself with habits to, mm -hmm. to be more successful. Yeah, and I think, it, like. I think those work hand in hand. What are my sure. goals and what are the habits that are going to help me get there? Sure. And so it's doing kind of a life assessment at first and saying, okay, well, if I want to um, sell $30 million of real estate this year, then what are the habits that I'm doing that are prohibiting that? And mm -hmm. what are the ones that I need to pick up that will facilitate that? Sure. And then kind of breaking those down and, and then really saying, okay, why am I doing them? 
Like, am I putting that habit next to, uh, like, let's say my habit is I want to get in shape or I want to be able to do 300 push-ups at a time. Well, any time before I pick up my phone to look at social media, I've got to do 10 push-ups, right? <laughs> so something like that. So when you're like, okay, there's something I don't really want to do with a reward at the end of it, yeah, um, and kind of incentive, you like kind of hang the carrot for yourself, then it's you just kind of get into that habit. So. Atomic Habits. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna put that on my reading good list. That's good. I'm actually went back and uh, was reading Extreme Owner, Extreme Ownership again, yeah. and uh, yeah, looking for another book. So it's so good. Ask Blake. Yeah. Um, and I'm also reading one. I forget the the author's name, but it's what I think about when I run or when running, um, and it's just kind of story form. The guy's just a, a really good author. Mm. Um, there's no, no, so far, nothing like profound I've yeah, <laughs> gotten out of it. It's just a good Well, sometimes, read. yeah. You know, yeah. I, I started reading, uh, I read Jimmy Buffett's uh, Salty oh. Piece of Land. And, oh, um, I read that. Right after he passed away, you know, yeah. I, I'd had it sitting on my shelf forever, and so I picked it up. And is it good? It's just a good little fiction book, you know. It's, yeah. Um, I may very have to easy reading, and it's really cool. I may have to borrow that. Yeah. I'm try that. So I've got a couple of cool books about, like, uh, like uh, they all have kind of a beach theme. One was mm-hmm. a really good one. I know we're getting off subject here a little yeah. bit, but it's called Pirate Hunters. Okay, it's about modern day uh, people searching for treasure. Really, it's pretty interesting, you know, and uh, the modern technology they use, the laws around stuff that you find, and really? it's about these two guys that are trying to find one of the last remaining known pirate ships that went down. That also had, uh, you know, like the Spanish. Uh, what do they call them? Uh, Spanish galleons or whatever, uh-huh. where they were transferring money. Yeah, and so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to That's it. That's cool. And um, you can I don't know what the laws are now, but at the time of writing that book, they were saying that it's changing as far as like the stuff you find, you have to give back to whoever the sovereign country that it belongs to. Really? Versus like before that, you could actually keep it. Yeah, and people, that kind of takes away the drive to find it. Right? Yeah, or you know, buy it like people you? that are they're more interested in the notoriety. You okay, know, yeah, because yeah. it's, you know, to find something of value, yeah. even if it goes to a museum, yeah. to have your name attached That's to it. Cool. Yeah. You know, so it's not really about getting rich anymore, yeah. even though it used to be. And so yeah. they kind of talk about that. And they talk about some of the guys that made millions, you know, made yeah. fortunes that were just either got really lucky or they were just super driven and were able to locate using very little information, um, going and digging through archives at libraries yeah. about these old – Spanish ships that went down and trying to geolocate where they are and, and the technology they use to, to find it. And then they have to dive down and yeah. dealing with weather. And it's pretty crazy. That, and so, <laughs> uh, you ever it's called that? Pirate Hunters. Yeah, when, one thing that I've tried to do that I haven't been great at, but forming the habit, <laughs> kind of basing off that um, Atomic Habits book, is instead of sitting in my bed and playing on my phone until I fall asleep, is have a, a nonfiction, just kind of fun book there. And yeah. so, and it and next to my bed. And so I've got the, the conscious choice, pick up the book, pick up the phone. And, and so that makes it easier. But another thing I, I did really well beginning this year that fallen, has fallen off in the past month is at the end of each day, writing down three wins from the day and then writing down three, three wins that I would like for, for, to happen tomorrow that would make tomorrow a win. That's something you used to, you've been doing for a while. I have, right. um, but lately, like the not. past six weeks, I just I haven't been doing it. Mm. Um, and again, extreme ownership, I just got to put a better habit around it. The book hasn't been in front of me to where at night I just forget about it. Mm. Um, now we just created, we just turned our last extra space, which was my office slash guest bedroom, into a nursery. And so I lost my desk, I lost my office. And so, oh, congratulations! I don't you. know yeah. if we talked about that. Yeah. But yeah, you guys are expecting. We are. Yeah, okay. New Year's Eve. Family's growing. So little boy, New Year's Eve. So, awesome. Yeah, yeah, party time in the hospital. So, um, so now my office is literally my bag, and so everything's in there, and it's just not in front of me. And so, like the habit would be, hey, maybe when I get home for the day, that book comes out and goes next to my my bed, mm-hmm. right? And that would be a habit. It's like, okay, I see it. I can. It's easy to do if I remember to do it. So yeah. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. Cool. Well, yeah, we need to have a we need to have a book swap yeah. or something because um, I got recently into uh, audio books and uh, okay. that's a good way to passively. Con- I don't I don't yeah. really consider that reading. You'll hear yeah. people say, "Oh, I read a, you know ten books last month," and I was like, "Well, <laughs> like, how'd you, you, know, you just listen to it?" <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, but it is a, a passive way to uh, consume a book or knowledge. Yeah, you know, I haven't pulled that trigger yet, and it's um, it's probably in my future one because I'm running out of space in my house for new books. Um, but two, I just, I can't consume at the rate that I buy them. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's and tough. so I've got, you know, 
40 books that I'm like, okay, that that's in line, mm-hmm. but then I'll hear something on a podcast. Oh, I got to order that one too. Yeah. But I drive, I, you know, my truck is my, my office. And so I'm always listening to podcasts. Yeah, check so. out audio books. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It'll happen. So. Um, well, man, it's awesome to catch up and kind yeah. of get a finger on the pulse of, of what's happening as yeah. far as the market and everything. And, uh, I think the take home point is, uh, things are looking good, things uh, are looking good for, uh, especially if you're a seller. <laughs> yeah. But uh, also, it was kind of cool to hear that um, if you are a buyer, you also have some some uh, things you can do to kind of put yourself in a better position to buy yeah. as well. So that's cool. Absolutely. It's good to see you. Good to be yeah, back. Yeah, man. It's good to catch up. So, all right, man. Until next Til time. Until next time.